Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to MIFA Campus 2024, and welcome to Regina Pessoa, our, yeah. our MIFA Campus godmother this year. Very happy about that. Uh, so thank you, Regina, for uh, being with us today and for opening the MIFA Campus, guiding and inspiring all of us with your films. We appreciate the generosity of great artists uh, who give uh, some of their times to students and young professionals attending NC every year. This is part of our DNA in NC, always been. This is why we are welcoming every year, and this year is a new record, more than 4,000 students. You are the professionals of tomorrow, clearly tomorrow, since some of you will be recruited here, hopefully, in the MIFA campus, through the many recruiting sessions taking place also all week. Before giving uh, the, the mic to Regina, we'd like to point out that MIFA campus started in 2017. This year is our eighth edition, and the previous godmothers and godfathers were Guillermo del Toro, Richard Williams, Nora Tuome, Marguerite Abue, Mazaki USA, and finally Jorge Gutierrez last year as Mexico was the, the guest country. We will never thank them enough, them and you, Regina, uh, for your generosity. So I wish you a great session with Regina and a wonderful week in Annecy. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you, thank you for coming so early this morning. Um, and uh, well, I'm here to talk about my creative process. Uh, and I, I put my my uh, timer to not talk too much. Um, and to talk about my my work, my creative process, um, my films through my career became quite personal. There is a, a reason behind that. Uh, so, of course, to talk about my work, I have to talk about myself. So, uh, who am I? Um, I, I grew up uh, in Portugal, uh, in a small village that we can see uh, there. And uh, I grew up without, uh, excuse me, my timer is... Uh, Again, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I grew up without television, uh, so without uh, education in moving image. Uh, and the first film, I, it was a small village in Portugal after the, um, the revolution, the democratic revolution, so a, a very poor country with uh, limit, uh, limited access to culture. And the, the first film I watched, uh, after uh, it was already after the revolution, it was this old film, uh, old Chaplin's film, Black and White, um, a man arrived to the village and offered free uh, screenings of Chaplin's films to the people. Uh, and my sister, she was older than me, uh, she was nine, I was four, and she said, we go. Uh, and I was marveled, especially with this scene where he was eating his boots, and he was uh, eating with such relish that uh, we, me and my sister, we, was, we were always starving. We uh, were whispering to each other, it must be chocolate because it was black and white. So uh, a black and white film. Um, my first uh, moving image experience in a big screen. Uh, without television, without access to uh, culture, uh, how did I pass my uh, free time. Well, I used to draw a lot. I always like to draw, but I start drawing in a very peculiar way. Um, as I said, it was a poor country. There was not um, abundance of materials like in our days. So we didn't have uh, spare paper or crayons. 
And I start drawing guided by an adult, my uncle, the bachelor in the family, so the one that had time for his nephews. And his uncle was Uncle Thomas. And he would uh, group us, the nephews, and he would say, let's draw. So we'd pick charcoal from the fireplace, and uh, we w it would lead us to draw on the walls of the, his house. So it was a very unusual way to start drawing. And of course, it marked uh, my path uh, in several ways, because it showed us that uh, if we want to be creative, there are no limits. OK, you don't have uh, normal materials, but there is charcoal from the fireplace. There is walls, so there are no limits for creativity. And another point that was important, it, it, it's that uh, uh, we knew that it was a bit of forbi forbidden thing to draw on the walls. And there, there we were guided by an adult. So that was this subversive uh, uh, detail about it that was re also very exciting. Another point, it was they were uh, uh, an unusual way to draw. It was uh, taking us out of the comfort zone. Normally, we, we draw in uh, uh, a, a little paper, and this was big size drawing. So out taking us out of the comfort zone always uh, was an exciting thing because the results are very surprising. Then uh, when I, um, uh, I, I went to Porto, I left the village, I went to the beautiful city of Porto that we see here. I, uh, in high school I studied art and curiously this is a drawing, the house is a drawing from uh, uh, when I was in, still in high school. And uh, we were studying other kinds of perspective. Uh, I chose the Indian perspective for this drawing, where the point of view is uh, um, unusual. It comes from the, the viewer and not from the horizon. And curiously, this house was Uncle Thomas' house. And somehow, Already at that time, when I was in high school, my uh, personal style uh, was being already defined. Then I went to uh, art school. I studied painting. I never studied, an uh, studied animation. But uh, throughout my path, I, uh, while I was studying, uh, I, I needed a part-time job to help to pay my studies. And I heard about a small animation studio that was engaging students. I have no idea what animation was. I grew up without television, so my notion about animation, it's like everybody else. Oh, it's cartoons, it's for kids. So, OK, I went there. Uh, and the director of the studio uh, is Abby, was Abby, that is here, that became my, my partner. And he saw my portfolio very slowly. And after a long time, in silence, he said, OK, you will start tomorrow. Uh, so uh, more than 30 years after, I'm still here. <laughs> um, and first, uh, as I said, I didn't know anything about animation. And uh, I start working in Abby's films. So. Uh, I, it was he who teach me uh, uh, how to do animation. And later, uh, when we finish one of his films, he encouraged us, the next generation, the young people that was we were working with him, to start our own uh, projects, to make our own films that were starting to uh, have in Portugal a uh, 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 available funding, so it was worthwhile to try. And this idea of uh, making my own film was so exciting. I, I really want to grab it. So I start trying to write a story, but I didn't know anything about cinema. Uh, uh, and the more I tried to follow the brief notions I had about uh, how to write a script, 
structure, introduction, a turning point, ta ta ta, the more stiff the result was, and uh, it was really not good. And then again, Abby played an important role. He told me, no, 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 forget about these rules. Don't, it, your, your work will become stiff. No, just think about something that is important for you. Because if it is important for you, you will show this in your images. We will be involved with your images. And somehow the people who will see those images will feel that commitment. And that uh, resonates in my head, that what he said really uh, makes sense for me. Uh, so I thought, OK, I don't know anything about cinema, but I want to make a film. So uh, better to be humble and pick a simple subject, that, but that is meaningful to me. So I thought, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the dark. So why not to try that? So this became my first film. It's a very simple subject. It's a girl who is afraid of the dark, based on my own experiences, because uh, at least I knew what I was talking about. So here we see the first scene of the film, the introduction of the film, based on a my room uh, in the village from where I was a kid. And I add another detail. My mother had schizophrenia, and I, I remember when I was a kid, she was always uh, a strange person. So uh, to, for the film, I combine these two elements, the darkness and that strange character that was my mother when I was a kid. And I use these two elements to compose the film. Starting the uh, visual research, actually, uh, when I started the first, uh, my first intention, it was to uh, make the film in puppets, in stop motion. So uh, you see here my attempts to uh, imagine a, a puppet, a structure. And then, uh, keeping developing the characters, I make the I, did, I draw the the girl character with this pencil by accident, and I enjoy very much this color. So I developed the storyboard um, for the film with that same pencil, and the more I develop it, the more I like the result, the the texture, the light, the color. And little by little, I've abandoned the idea uh, of making the film in puppets. And I decide to make the film with, uh, in 2D animation, but with a technique that could respect this visual. But how? And you will see uh, throughout my presentation, it's always uh, about questions and uh, how to re uh, resolve uh, difficulties and trying to find answers for that. So how to, what, which technique would I use to make this kind of visuals? Then I remember uh, 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 already very known um, filmmaker, Piotr Domala, that I have seen, and this is our images from one of his films. And somehow, his visuals uh, remind me my own storyboard. So I, uh, I th we thought, me and Abby, why not to try to make the film in his technique, which is animation on plaster plates? But again, another question. But how? I never have done this before. And at that time, it was very difficult to contact people. Internet was at the beginning, and uh, it was not that easy. So I start my own research. Uh, what kind of paint to use? How to make a, a plaster plate? Uh, so I after many attempts, I built that one little one rough uh, plaster plate. And I was happy because I could make, um, it was, I was able to make a nice image on it. 
I was happy with the result, so I made the film like this. And here it's me building the plaster plates. So it consisted in a wooden frame, like you see here, that I would place on a glass. And then I would put the liquid plaster inside, let it dry, make a texture uh, all over with sandpaper and cover with this dark ink that I made in large quantities all over. Then install that plate uh, under the camera, at the time still a 35 uh, millimeter camera, and on the same plate I would develop each scene by scratching, changing the position, painting, scratching, and so on, like we see here uh, in the little uh, making of movie. Of course, it was uh, a long process. <laughs> uh, and I was, as I said, I was studying. Uh, I never f uh, stopped my studies. I was studying and making the film at the same time. And now let's see a little bit of the film. Lua nasceu e desceu lá do Um hino de paz e And to make the uh, round story, this voice is my mother. The next film I made, uh, it was tragic story with happy ending. And actually, the film, uh, the idea, the story uh, uh, showed up with this uh, rough drawing. And uh, it actually, it was a sentence that popped up in my head. And the sentence was, uh, once upon a time, there was a little girl which heart beat faster than other people's. And I enjoyed very much this sentence. So quickly, uh, I make this sketch, because often we, we don't take notes of uh, something that we, is interesting. We immediately forget. And later we say, oh, well, I had a nice idea what it was. I don't remember. So this drawing was important. But at the time, as I said, I was uh, animating my first film and uh, uh, studying in art school at the same time. So uh, I used that story, uh, not for a film, that sentence, but to develop the series of uh, silk uh, print and engravings that I was also learning at art school. And uh, uh, that sentence gave origin to an image, and that image gave origin to a new sentence, and so on. And in the end, I had a story. Meanwhile, I finished um, The Night, uh, my first film. And Abby said, oh, your first film, it went well. Why don't you pick this uh, story that you developed in a art school and you adapt it to a new film? So I start making the storyboard. Um, and I like to uh, work the storyboard. It's my first vision of the film, my first editing. And uh, of course, the visual research, trying to develop the character, and uh, how I wanted, which visual I wanted for the film. Of course, keeping the, the uh, visual research. But um, 
this time I didn't want to use again uh, engraving on plaster because uh, it's a lonely technique, alone in the dark room scratching. And I knew that uh, this, this uh, uh, sketches, this uh, visual research was made in a scraper board, which is a, a thick cardboard uh, black that we scratch and the, the, the white comes out. And I knew it was not possible to make animation on it. Uh, on it. So uh, another question, how to have this visual in a technique that is possible to animate? And one day, uh, by coincidence, I was hanging a poster uh, in the studio, and I enjoyed very much the touch of the paper. And I said, mm, this paper is so nice. Maybe I can put the uh, dark ink and scratch on it. I tried with this sketch and it worked. Uh, but it worked in a still image. I didn't know if it, it worked, uh, if it was possible to animate on it. So conceptually, I imagine a technique like at that time we still animated on paper. And I, my concept was, well, maybe I can animate on paper and then make photocopies of that animation on this poster paper, cover with the ink and scratch. And uh, with the photocopy, I have the line of the animation so I can uh, scratch without uh, uh, damaging the animation. I would have a guideline. But it was necessary to try it. So I made a short loop uh, on paper. I animated that. And then I made photocopies of that animation on this poster uh, paper. Uh, you, uh, you, I, you can see still the, the cuttings of the paper. So I make the photocopies, I cover with black ink, I scratch, and it was working. So uh, my producers were generous enough to accept this technique. And my producers were Abby, Marcel Jean, uh, the, the artistic director of this festival, and uh, Patrick Evnaud, the former director of the festival. So I was very lucky to have these co-producers, and it was my, my first co-production co with France and Canada. Here, uh, my French team, uh, I worked uh, at uh, artist uh, in residence at Folimage at that time. And my tools, very simple tools. Uh, uh, ink, uh, well, of course, pencil and rubber. But then uh, black ink, um, uh, a, uh, a sculpture. And the process was very simple as well. Um, drawing animation, a photocopy of that animation on this a poster paper, then meanwhile I have bought in large quantities, cover with black ink, and scratch to have the final result. But this time, for the first time, I could have a team working with me, and uh, we used software because uh, all the elements were in different papers that we would scan and combine in a single image like everything was together. And now I show you a little bit of the film. Once upon a time, there was a little girl whose heart beat faster than other people's.
film I made is Kali the Little Vampire. And of course, I have to tell the story behind. A uh, tragic story was, uh, we can say that it was a very successful film for a short film. It won Ansi Grand Prix. Uh, Grand Prix. Um, it won more than 50 awards, international awards. And it was even in the Oscars shortlist. And this sounds very good. But uh, of course, there is always another side. And the other side is the pressure. And people start telling me, Regina, it will be hard for you. You cannot do better than this. Uh, and this is uh, hard to hear and somehow true. Uh, because we know that it's very hard to repeat um, success, what the notion we have of success. It's very hard to have the same results every film we, we make. Uh, and of course, uh, I could not stop my career there. I wanted to do uh, another films. Anyway, this pressure um, made me uh, think and about my work and I realized I was using the same kind of the same subject spheres difference um, I was using the same techniques uh, engraving uh, focus a lot of focus in uh, shadow and light and it was like I was following the growth of a character small a little uh, uh, older uh, so I thought maybe it's time to um, make another episode of this growth of this character and uh, let this ca character uh, grow and uh, accept uh, and find his place in, in the world. Uh, so this, it was my reasoning behind Kali the Little Vampire and, and I decided to make a trilogy. Uh, about childhood. Of course, uh, I was more uh, uh, a lot under a lot of pressure, like I said, and the important step in my uh, work is the research, and the documentary research is very important. So I was, um, I was collecting information also, not, not only for the film, but also to uh, give me confidence. So each element that I would research would contribute to give me some confidence to move on with the script. The storyboard, again, uh, may be more and more detailed uh, because, as I said, is important for me. And also, um, uh, animation is becoming more and more competitive. There are more people, uh, and we need to show that our idea is uh, good enough, strong enough to get some funding. So it's nice to have a good presentation, a convincing presentation. And of course, my visual research, uh, at that time still on that poster paper, and uh, this time I needed some color, so uh, some red on it. Uh, keeping my research, I found this visual and I said, oh, I really like that. I want this for the visual of the film. Uh, but it was still on paper and then uh, I, had, I was having uh, uh, again a co-production with France and Canada, but with a new French producer that was a bit nasty. <laughs> and uh, he said, Regina, you cannot work by hand. You have to use a software. It's too expensive. So uh, at the beginning, I was shocked because of my, all my background to work by hand with the very uh, organic visuals. And uh, I tried to resist. But after a while, I said, wait, Regina, um, software and computers are the tools of our days, and if I don't learn them now, uh, maybe later is too late as well. So I decided finally to accept the challenge, but one thing was important for me, and one thing that I didn't like with the uh, films totally made with the software is that I 
would recognize the software, not the person who did it. I, I would see a film uh, in a festival and I said, oh, it was made with TV paint. I, would, I didn't recognize the person behind it. And I didn't want that for me. I already had created my own language and I didn't want to lose it for a software. So I accept this challenge, but with one condition. And the condition was I want the software obey me and work for me. So I developed a research, a, a, a long file, with the kind of uh, engraving lines that I needed and brush strokes. And then my team in Canada, at National Film Board, uh, my technical team developed nice brushes for me. About the software, I tried many. I was a beginner. But it was really hard to get nice feeling. Uh, and finally, someone told me, Regina, why you don't try Photoshop? Uh, it came out with a timeline. And I tried. And at, at one point, it made uh, sense for me. And I made the first uh, test um, with Photoshop, an animated test. And I en enjoy very much the result. And I forgot that it was a software, because I could control it. And I could. Uh, it became just a tool. And this was a very important um, learning for me. Uh, we can use whatever uh, tool, uh, digital or analog, the important it is use it as a tool that you can uh, control. And then it becomes just a tool. Uh, so uh, I made the film with the software. But for it, I would have a team, and I. I wanted them to also control the software and not the software controlling them. So I wrote a manual for my team so they would go straight to the right tools and not be lost in the software. The process, very similar uh, to what I, when I was working analog. So the layout, the L animation line, with the information for the uh, uh, light areas, cover with black, this time we, with software, St scratch, almost there, add some color, and the background. And now we see a little thing, a uh, bit of the film. Darkness. Darkness gives form to all things and to all beings in the universe. The animals, the people, the moon, and me. So this is Kali the Little Vampire. And after all the, the, these three films, I think finally I start defining what I need for my creative process. But in my case, for, for other people, probably it will be different. And what I need is these steps. Uh, to myself, I need to reply to three questions, which is what, why, and how. Uh, the what is the idea, what I want to do. Uh, the why, it's the, for me the most important uh, note because it's the motivation. And the how is what technique, how to make a film. But the, the motivation is very important for me because we all have to confess that animation can be very, very boring. It can be a very boring task. So if we have a good reason, a motivation, a good motivation to do it, it will help us throughout the, the process. Uh, applying these uh, notions to my last film, um, I wanted to make a film about my uncle. Again, I like round stories. And I wanted to make a tribute to that uncle, Uncle Thomas, with whom I started drawing when I was a kid. 
And this was my main idea. And this is uh, for pictures of his house. And somehow, without realizing the color palette of the film, it was already defined here, almost. The motivation, the most important thing. Um, my uncle, of course, the main motivation was to pay him a tribute because I start drawing with him and finally is what I do now for a living. And this was my main motivation to pay a tribute to someone that it was very, uh, it had a very important role in my life. But there was also other details. My uncle uh, had a lot of obsessions. Uh, in his generation, of course, it was he was not uh, didn't use to apply names. Uh, to uh, he was just people would say he's, he was just a little funny, but probably today would find a, a kind of uh, Asperger syndrome or something. Uh, but as he was uh, uh, not, uh, he, uh, he was a peculiar man, uh, and we lived in the village. People uh, also make fun of him. Oh, it's a bit loony. And for me, it was so important. So my motivation was I want to show that one doesn't need to be ex to be a, an important person or, or make extraordinary, extraordinary things to be important in our life. And this was my motivation. Uh, talking about my uncle's obsessions, the main one was numbers. He was obsessed with numbers, and uh, he didn't have a regular job, and he would keep part of his day just to make calculations with no purpose, just for him, his obsession, and it was important for him. And of course, as a kid, that fascinated me, and I... It, I thought it was beautiful, these, all these lines and numbers so well uh, drawn. Uh, so when he passed, I kept as much possible of his uh, calculation papers, and I wanted to use that in the film. He also kept a diary, and uh, which is very touching for me, because living in a village with a very simple life, he always found, uh, found out something to write about every day. And uh, it's, it was very simple, but very touching. And I wanted to use that also in the film. And of course, I want to use his objects. He always carried with him a pen knife uh, and uh, it was a constant presence in my memories. My uncle uh, with his pen knife making toys for us. Uh, I want to use these objects in the film. So I had all this material and memories, but it was a real person. Uh, for the first time, I was assuming a really a autobiographical film. So I had all this material and memories, and I didn't know how to organize them. So a friend told me I was lost, and a friend told me, Regina, write a letter to your uncle, a posthumous letter. Maybe it helped you to recall the most important uh, episodes. I wrote that letter, and it worked. Uh, and uh, uh, I have the episodes I wanted to develop, and the letter uh, was beautiful, and my producers decided, Regina, you have to use parts of this letter as voiceover. But again, another question. I have all these episodes, but how to place them? What's the order? I didn't know. So I decided to start the storyboard with no order, just draw scene by scene uh, without uh, notion how to place them in the film. And I draw the storyboard like this. I found the empty uh, calculation book uh, among my uncle belongings. And I decided to use it because I thought, oh, this would be inspiring for me while making the storyboard. And again, talking about collaborations, another important collaboration is a author very known to you is Andrea Cicade. 
And in a meeting in a festival, he asked me what I was doing. And I told briefly the pitch of my uncle. And um, I said that I was uh, having trouble with the script because I didn't know how to order the scenes. And he proposed me a deal like, Regina, I help you with your script. And when you finish, you will help with my film. So we kind of verbally signed this gentleman agreement. And it was very important for me, Andreas, to help me to um, decide my script because I was too close emotionally to the subject to decide certain important steps. Uh, that's why Andreas was important. So finally, I could make a proper storyboard. And another question. I wanted to use, as I said, objects, drawing on the wall, use my uncle paper, and of course, keep developing my personal style. But how to combine all these different visuals in a coherent way? Uh, so I developed these scenes before starting the official production uh, to try to understand if it was possible to combine them. It was. I obtained really something that uh, it was coherent with all these different techniques. So um, again, uh, I would work with a team and I wrote my manual for my, for my team to help them to go uh, straight to do the important tasks. And meanwhile, I moved to the countryside long before pandemic. And uh, so I worked online with my team um, since 2016. Uh, so the manual was also important for that. And also, we would exchange the files uh, via internet. Uh, so when they would receive the files, it was important uh, uh, very uh, simple visual language to explain how, what were the tasks that I was expecting from there, them and uh, how they should send me the result. Uh, on the top, we can see for a single um, character all the layers I needed. And here we can see uh, evolu evolu evolution of a scene from storyboard to the final scene. As you see, I animated the motorcycle first with uh, these uh, blocks because I was not sure if I was able to draw a motorcycle. And finally, these uh, blocks helped me to structure the motorcycle. Um, as we'll see, or maybe you already noticed, I like a lot POVs in my films. Uh, and they were Im very important for this one as well. And I got inspiration from views from my village. But I animate them, I prefer to animate them by hand. Because the little perspective mistakes that it gives, uh, for me it's much more charming and uh, faithful to the images we have in our memories that are never very clear. So uh, the drawing on the wall, the, one of the main scenes that marked my life. Uh, I animate the first, uh, the, the, the lady, the characters, and then we build a proper set. And I received two uh, Canadian animators. It was part of the co-production deal. Uh, they would project my animation on the wall and would retrace it with charcoal. And uh, I would use that, integrate that with uh, the other scenes and my style. Also, uh, there was some shadow, uh, light and shadow scenes in the film and we animate in stop motion, projecting the shadows on these uh, walls, this set. Uh, and then I would integrate this uh, shooting uh, with the other style of the film, with my textures. And of course, the same for my uncle papers. 
So I used mixed techniques uh, and uh, integrating them with my style. And finally, I'm very, very happy with the result. And it's something that I want to keep using. Finally, uh, an important step uh, in my creative process, the comfort zone. And here we have my studio with my uh, mood wall and uh, my space where I feel safe and secure and uh, nobody have to, uh, can disturb me. Almost finishing, I sh uh, this was a co-production with uh, France, Canada, and UK. Uh, Phil Davis uh, was a very, very important uh, role in this film. As I show, um, that image uh, with the trees is where I live in Portugal, in the countryside. And my main animators, these three uh, animators that are in the map of, my, of Portugal were my main animators. They were all in different cities and we were working online. And the picture we see um, Abi, my pr Portuguese producer, Julie, my Canadian producer, and Normand Roger, the author of the amazing soundtrack. And uh, finally, I, I hope I have here, maybe I, I forgot to add. I would like to show you something. Just give me a minute to check if I have it. Hmm. I don't have it. Uh, but I will tell. We, me and Abi, we have a museum in Portugal. Uh, moving Image Museum. I have some flyers here that I can give. Uh, and it's in this place where we live. So if you pass by Portugal, uh, please visit our museum. It's very interesting and very rich. And um, there is also an exhibition here in Ansi at uh, the Museum of Animation. Uh, with originals uh, of all these films that I just showed you. And uh, to finish my presentation, I would like to screen Uncle Thomas uh, because, well, I think it resumes uh, what I said about my creative process. Let's see it. <laughs> Seven, five hundred fifty-one, thirty-three. Dear Uncle Thomas, you had no regular job, you had no wife, you had no children. Even as a little girl, I felt you were a bit strange with your numbers, your manias, your endless paths. Whatever you did fascinated me with your methodical, repetitive and endless rituals.
The others earned their living. They had no time to lose. To them, you were nobody. You were useless. But to me, you were extraordinary. Maybe you were looking for the meaning of life, and you took all your time. These are complicated baths. One must be very meticulous and thoroughly clean every little part of one's body. Otherwise, one feels filthy and dignified. You were my Uncle Thomas, the first person to whom I run when I needed help. Today, I took a bath. I shaved. I brushed my teeth. But it takes me hours. It's a long, painful ordeal. Be careful with the head proportions. The ears are placed at high level, you see? And the nose is placed at ear height. Uncle Thomas had a girlfriend once. Uncle Thomas is a sentimental.
Dear Madam, I offer you my compliments with great respect and devotion. I wish you true happiness. Due to extenuating circumstances, I have but remained... But there were mysteries and shadows in your life. I know your phone number. And A letter, perhaps never posted, perhaps never answered. 372. 372. And your obsessions, your accounting, the calculations, the figures, the numbers. Seven years time. All this tormented you. Go away! And your promise is broken down today. With time, in hints, I understood that before me there was happiness and abundance. And then the collapse, the ruin, the whispers, and the silence. Something had broken in me. It seemed that you carried all alone the burden of the ruin of the entire family. In your house, in your room, in your head. Incessantly, lost in the numbers and obstinate in the calculations, you were hoping to find the error. I couldn't understand. I was disturbed, but I still hope to succeed. It comforts me that I could say one last time, Uncle Thomas, I love you very much. Of course, of course, we all love each other. is me who writes you this letter that will never be answered. Well, um, I finished my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I think, if I'm not wrong, that uh, we still have some minutes for uh, questions and answers, if you wish. <laughs> Do someone wants to say something? Um, hi, 
big fan of your work. Um, I wanted to ask, since uh, on your short films you always talk about um, themes that are very important to you and very close to you, um, how do you do to talk about these themes and, for example, um, uh, being able to produce something and like if you get crit uh, criticized on it, not take it too personally? <laughs> well, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, um, I wanted to grab this opportunity to uh, m could m make films because I was, when I met Tabi and uh, when I met animation, he showed me this other side of uh, animation that I didn't know, which is the author animation. And one thing that uh, really... Uh, made an impression on me is that I could see that uh, other authors, uh, they uh, talk often about their personal uh, things or they would choose uh, subjects that were important for them. Maybe not personal, but they, they were meaningful for them. Uh, and I, I was very shy. I, as I said, I didn't have no uh, background in cinema, and uh, but I wanted to grab this opportunity, and uh, and I felt very insecure. I say I don't have this uh, background uh, like Abi. Abi, um, his films are more about uh, the social uh, soul of Portugal. Uh, he comes from a family that uh, always fought for social rights. Uh, but I don't feel that strength, nor, nor that uh, knowledge, especially that knowledge. Uh, so I was very humble somehow, and the only thing I knew it was about my personal stuff. That's uh, at the beginning it was an issue because I wanted, I would like to talk about important things, uh, uh, important subjects. But I, I was not feeling. Um, uh, I didn't. I felt. I felt that I didn't have the knowledge enough to talk about the, in the name of a group or in the name of a, a country. So, but I can talk uh, in my own name. Uh, so I picked the subjects that were closer to me as uh, to be able to produce films, to be able to make something, and I found out something very interesting. Uh, for instance. Uh, for the night, uh, a lot of people came to me uh, saying, Regina, thank you for your film. You really uh, transmit uh, the feeling of, of being alone in the dark and being afraid. And I realized that uh, if one talks about something uh, that is important for, for our own, uh, something important for us. We are also giving voice to other people uh, because, for instance, not everyone is able to draw or to produce images, uh, but I can. Uh, I, uh, I can do that. So uh, somehow, talking about personal issues, we are talking a lot, giving voice to a lot of people. So, no, I don't feel uh, shamed to talk about my uh, fragilities because they are the fragilities of a, a lot of people and it's important to talk about them. Um, uh, and uh, I, as I said, uh, I don't make it personally. I use uh, this material uh, in a kind of cold way, uh, so it's this balance. I, I, I'm making a film, and the film, uh, every film is meant to be seen by a, a, an audience. Uh, so my deal is also a, a very cold, I have to do, see it in a very cold perspective to balance uh, my, my personal details, my personal memories that I know very well in my head, but uh, show them in a format, which is film, cinema, that is meant to be understood by an audience using the language of cinema. 
So it's a, a good exercise for me as well, this balance between personal and using the film language in a, a proper way for people to understand it. Um, finally, it, for me it works. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not still able to talk in the name of a group or in the name of a country, or uh, I don't ambition. Uh, I don't have the ambition to be uh, ground, <laughs> uh, but I can talk in my name, and uh, uh, so often the individual uh, details are also uh, the collective details of a lot of people. Thank you very much. Can you pass the mic? Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your presentation, uh, Regina. It was beautiful. I have a question because your films are very grounded and very personal. I was curious to know why you chose. <laughs> oh, you are in the dark. <laughs> like Kali. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks a lot. It, it was beautiful. And um, yeah, I was wanted to know because your films are very personal and very grounded uh, in where you grew up and the territory. And I was curious to know why you chose to do your uh, final film in English instead of Portuguese, for instance. Uh, I explain. Uh, it was again a co-production with Canada, France, and Portugal. And if you co-produce with National Film Board, National Film Board is a bilingual country, so it's very clear that they protect. Uh, they have to deliver a version in English and French. So I have actually three versions: Portuguese. Uh, French and English, but the English and the uh, French versions, uh, it was because I have this co-production with Canada and I have to respect their production laws. Uh, hello, uh, I'm here, uh, I yeah. have a question. Uh, how do you find your style of art? Uh, it began very early and um, at the beginning, when I started uh, working in animation, I felt very insecure because I start late. I, I was already 22, and uh, normally people start earlier than that, and they make uh, uh, they study animation in schools. I didn't, as I said, I start working straight in uh, a production. So at the beginning I said, oh, uh, I'm not as good as my colleagues. Uh, I didn't study animation. But finally, uh, I study art. And finally I found out that uh, having uh, uh, art, uh, art studies, it's much better than study animation. And it's, uh, and in art studies, from the beginning, we are uh, guided to every, uh, every teacher, find your own style, find your own style. This is the main thing. And I, f I think in animation, <laughs> the people that study animation is the other way around. They imitate styles. They follow this cartoon style. And I don't like that. <laughs> I'm glad I never studied animation. I'm glad that I studied art. And I'm glad that I was guided to find my own style. Uh, and that uh, was already defined uh, before I started animation. Thank you very much, Regina. You were really generous with your class. I learned so much. Um, but uh, when you were sharing your process, uh, I was just able to read until the three, the point three, and I saw there was another point, and I was so, uh, you know, like. <laughs> there, caused... there you we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much because you you, you spoke about what. Um, Yes, thank you so much. You, you, you talk about the, the, your idea, 
your motivation, how, which is so interesting? Uh, Be because the how is uh, when I develop my visual research. And when, we are uh, when I start developing my visual research, I try a lot of things. And uh, Avi knows that uh, I say, at least when we start something, I need three days at least, and I think I wrote that, no, it's in another presentation. Uh, I need three days, because the first day when I start the research, it's terrible. The results are really, really bad. The second day uh, is even worse, and uh, uh, when I start the project, I say, I will, I, I be, I will, I, I will not succeed, I will, I'm not able to do anything, and it's always the same speech. <laughs> I be tired of it, but I can I cannot get out of it. Anyway, the second day is really really bad and the third day I just don't give up because of I'm ashamed to give up and I go there with no hope and I start uh, it's a mess. But normally by the end of the third day in the corner of one of the sketches there is something that <gasps> Maybe this is not too bad. So uh, it's the beginning of. Uh, so we need to uh, make a lot of errors and mistakes to uh, and not be ashamed of it. It's the process of creation, and this visual research. Uh, the angle is like this. We try many different st uh, uh, styles and mat techniques, but then at one point when you find that little detail that is guiding us, the process is like this. Okay, we cannot use everything that we tried. I choose this technique, like I showed in my, pr my presentation. So we follow that lead. But yes, at the beginning is quite, uh, uh, disappointing. So, uh, yeah, I uh, fight a lot with myself. I uh, have a lot of uh, lack of confidence uh, and insecurities, and I made a lot of mistakes. That's how I find uh, the style that I want to follow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, uh, my hosts are saying that our time is over. So thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> and for people that want to visit us in Portugal, there are some flyers.